Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to give you all a heads up that we're going to get started at 1.45 um, today. Um, our last committee ran long, and so um, we're going to push this one back just a few minutes. And Jordan was short notice. I'm sorry, Amanda, there was a weird echo. What was that? Sorry about that. I am live on YouTube and I am almost ready in eScribe. So if you want to give me just two more minutes, I should be ready there as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Jordan, we are ready on eScribe as well. Thanks, Amanda. I'm going to hold this over um, until uh, 145, um, and that's when um, the rest of the committee members will join.
Okay, um, good afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and call the Land Use Planning Committee to order. Thanks everyone um, for your patience for um, the late start. Um, we continue to meet virtually uh, via Zoom. Anyone joining us um, or anyone wishing to join the live meeting for public comment um, can find the agenda and the link to join the meeting at uh, ci.missoula.mt.us slash webcasts. Um, from there, you can uh, click the link to join the meeting um, and also find um, call in instructions to join us by phone. If you're um, joining by phone, um, you can press star nine to raise your hand. If you're in the Zoom platform, you can use the hand raise function and um, that'll indicate to me that you wanna give public comment. Um, and testing the hand raise function is Julie Merritt. Uh, I'm sorry, we are not able to turn our video on. Oh, okay. Um, we'll see if we can get that troubleshoot, uh, get that worked out here. Okay, try try again. You should be able to now. Great. Okay, um, so um, our first item of business is roll call. Um, Amanda, can you call the roll? Yes. Anderson? Present. Becerra? Absent? Contos? Here. Hart? Present. Hess? Present. Jones. Present. Merritt. Present. Ramos. Absent. Cheryl. Present. Vasika. Present. Von Mossberg. Here. And West. Here. It looks like Ms. Becerra is here as well. Um, okay, on the agenda, we have um, approval of the minutes from July 21st. Um, I believe that's potentially an error. Um, it looks like there's an agenda attached, but um, but but no minutes. Um, maybe we can hold on that and take it up next time if that is something we need to do. It should be a sub item. I have approval of minutes and then approval of minutes from July 21st, 2021. Do you see that? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong thing. It looks like on the minutes for the 21st though, it's it's um, it's just one page. It looks like the entire minutes aren't aren't attached. I will take a look at that. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Um, so we can move on to public comment. Um, oh, Caitlin, did you? Yeah, um, we have some staff that are still in the waiting room. If you could, if admin could check that, and let them in. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we'll move on to public comment. Um, Anyone wishing to give public comment, please use the hand raise function. Um, seeing none. Um, Caitlin, who else are we expecting? We're good. Okay, great. Okay, um, so we can move on to our regular um, committee biz items of committee business. The first is an appointment to the City Board of Adjustment. Um, and um, I don't see anyone from the mayor's office here um, uh, to, to um, speak to the appointment, but um, the mayor has two appointments um, uh, to the Board of Adjustment um, listed on the agenda, and I'd entertain a motion for those. Julie? I would be happy to uh, recommend Joe Denhart and Ryan Morton um, as the mayor's appointments to the City Board of Adjustment. Thanks, the motion is in order. Any discussion? Any public comment? Okay, we can have a roll call vote on the appointments. Uh, 
All right, Anderson? Yes. Becerra? Yes. Contos? Yes. Park? Yes. Hess? Yes. Jones? Yes. Merritt? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Basica? Yes. Von Mossberg? Yes. <clears throat> yes. And Wes? Yes. Okay. Um, All right, I got 11 yeses and one absent. Great, so that can go on our consent agenda. Um, and our next item is um, a, I guess, post-public hearing item um, or mid-public hearing item um, for the England Boulevard annexation that we heard um, on Monday. Um, and so this is an opportunity um, uh, with our new process um, to um, get any new information from staff that may have come up or from, from the applicant um, to answer any questions that came up during the public hearing. Um, and then of course, to have a council discussion. So um, I don't believe, um, uh, I don't believe we have a presentation unless Caitlin, do you want to give a quick recap or, or anything or uh, how about this? If anyone wants a recap, um, please raise your hand. Okay, so we're all still good. Um, are, is there any new information from staff perspective or from um, the- No new information, but I see some hands raised. Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, Jordan, I'm here as a representative of the civil engineer, just in case there's any questions on our end of the project. I think Mike Morgan from Hoffman Morgan, the architect, is on the call as a participant. Oh, yeah, um, I, I don't know if you can promote him to a panelist. Yep, I'm doing that now. Um, Thank you. Great. It uh, looks like Mike is here now. Um, Mike, do you have any additional information to add at this point? Hello, uh, not new information. No, uh, I'd like to, sorry for our bad camera here. Just like to introduce to my right here, uh, Albert Oselmi and Nick Oselmi is with me, um, the owners of the property, and they'd be happy to tell a little bit about themselves if you'd like to hear that, but no new, new information. Okay. Um, yeah, the applicants, you're, you know, well, thank you for coming today and, and um, you're welcome. If you, if you want to give any, any introduction to the project, you're welcome to, you're, you're certainly not obliged to, but, but um, feel free if you'd like to. Well, thank you. My name is Albert Oselmi and my son Nick is sitting next to me. And uh, I've been a builder in the Missoula area since the early 90s. Um, my brother and I started in the early 90s building and, and uh, James Hoffman, he drew the first set of plans for us. And today we're using Mike, so we're still committed to this firm. Um, we've been building since those years and primarily in residential construction and apartments, specifically entry level apartments and also condos. Um, we uh, use uh, local contractors and local suppliers, so we keep all our business local. And our last project was on American Way. We built a 54 unit apartment building, rental apartment building on American Way. And it's right next to Home Depot. That's a very attractive building and it was well received. And we're looking to do something very, very similar to that right in this location, which we think would be ideal. That's all I have, thanks. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I have a hand up with, from Julie Merritt. Yeah, I know. I realize that what we're voting on is is the annexation and not necessarily what what will ultimately be built here. But I wonder um, if Caitlin or the um, the owners or Mike could re refresh us. You mentioned, I think, at least a preliminary idea of how many units were going to be uh, built here. And I was also curious about how that matches up with the uh, zoning that's being proposed as far as, uh, you know, um, the density that would be allowed under that zoning. So the um, 76 units are proposed and the zoning is one unit per thousand square feet. Both the parcels combined are 
um, 75, over 75,000 square feet to the point where um, the applicant could, and unless they've changed their mind, apply for an administrative adjustment to get that number rounded up because it's close enough to 76, but they'll have to go through administrative adjustment. Um, so yeah, 76. Perfect. Okay, Mirta. Um, yeah, a, a question. I'm not sure if it's for Caitlin or the developer. Um, uh, you know, as a representative of, of this ward, um, one of the main concerns that I hear from people is traffic. And I know that we are only looking at a rezone and, and that precludes any discussion about um, how traffic will be handled by an additional 76 units. Um, but um, um, Caitlin, maybe this is where you can um, just inform us what part of the process um, during the development after the rezone um, will address that issue. Um, so first with this process, with the annexation, we notify all city agencies, including you know, engineering streets, people who deal with traffic um, and no concerns have been brought up from public works. Uh, as far as um, the next step, which would be building permit, that would be uh, just going through engineering approval and Title 12 approval. Um, yeah. If the applicant or the civil representative wants to speak to that um, in more detail, floor is open. Mir, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think I knew that. I just want to make sure that people know that um, at such time when development happens, that there is a process and, and that they might have an opportunity to voice any concerns that I'm sure will be related to, to the, to the ad, added traffic that more residential um, development will bring to that area. As far as the public process goes, this is it. There's not another public process predicted for this development. So if anyone wants to submit public comment or concerns or get answers, I would say now, between now and Monday when y'all vote would be the time. Yeah, because during the building permit process, it's only a, an agency review essentially. So our city engineer will make the any recommendation or final um, input. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, um, Julie. Sorry, that does bring to mind one other question for me. Is there a, um, any plans to connect this with the um, with either of the developments that are like immediately to the south or the west of this property? There's, I mean, there's streets there. Will they be connected, or will it just be? Um, out on to England Boulevard. There's not much connection as you can see here on the preliminary site plan. Um, it's the development to the east is this cul-de-sac, which is a private road. So there's not much connection opportunity there. So it seems like just England Boulevard. And again, applicant, uh, feel free to chime in. Yes, that's right, Caitlin. Um, our, our plans are to just access uh, onto England Boulevard. Um, all the surrounding parcels are independent of this parcel. Okay. Okay, um, we don't have any additional hands up. Um, this is a, a pre. This is um, not an action item today. Oh, um, Heather. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate it. Um, to the build team, um, I, I, I think you're all very aware of our our initiatives to really try and um, promote as much affordable housing as possible. And as as you spoke to how you've addressed it in the past. Can you, would you be willing to talk to us a little bit more about what you're trying to do to be a part of the solution on housing in our community today, in particular, 
to those at area median income or below. Yes, uh, this will be a housing unit uh, based on market rents. And that's the only way we could make this project work with the banks and the cost of construction. So, uh, uh, and typically our units are entry level apartments. They're not luxury units. These are not luxury units, but we think they look wonderful from the outside. Typically the neighbors and the community is very happy with the way our projects look. And uh, once again, they're entry level apartment units. That's what they are, just market-based. And um, we're not looking for any tax, cre tax uh, credits from the government to, to uh, subsidize the rent. I appreciate that very much. I know this is a neighborhood that is ineligible for federal funding um, for subsidies. Um, do you, would you be willing to share with us what your target rents are going to be just for our Yeah, yeah uh, typically our one bedroom apartments will be in the 800s and the two bedroom units, depending on which units they are, will be in the upper, mid to upper 900s. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thanks, Heidi. I, I have a question about, um, I guess, are all the parcels around this uh, private roads, like the one you mentioned um, on the cul-de-sac? I was just wondering if there's maybe some opportunity for some uh, pedestrian or non-motorized access um, that would connect to some of these other streets. Obviously, it would have to be in collaboration with existing developments. It just seems like a... It would be great to have, you know, traffic being able to be dispersed um, and not all just be vehicles in and out of, oops, sorry, timer going off, uh, England Boulevard. The only private road is that Connery Circle that abuts the parcel like right here on the west. I think I said east last time and I meant west. Um, other than that, uh, no plans, but applicant, what do you think about that idea? Um, yes, because everything's private around there. Did you say that's a public road to the west? No, it's private. So since everything is private, uh, I think it's really difficult to link, but boy, we sure could easily if the neighbors to the west uh, at least in the pedestrian level, uh, wanted to have a link there. I think vehicular vehicular links get real uh, problematic because of parking. People tend to uh, park where they shouldn't, and that's that's always a problem when when developments interlink. We do have good strong link to uh, England Boulevard, cross pedestrian. Um, and vehicular, it's a good location for it. It's not next to an intersection, but also this is a bus route right on England. That's that's real positive uh, for this site. I found really positive. Uh, but but we haven't tried to pursue connections to other private properties adjacent to the property. Um, this kind of calls back to Mirta's original, or Mirta's not original, but her question. Um, I can check in with Public Works about to get some more details about traffic and come back with that on um, Monday before final consideration. When we check in on this, I can send you an email, especially since it's in y'all's ward. Um, and we can keep that conversation open. I can check in with Public Works to get some more information because it sounds like um, it's something people are concerned about. Um, on that note, I do want to highlight though, like this, this is in annexation area B, which is our, I mean, annexation area A, which is our highest priority for annexation. It's surrounded by infrastructure. It is almost wholly surrounded by, um, by city parcels. Um, it makes a ton of sense to develop here. Um, so it's, um, I don't want to send any mixed signals about that because I think, I think that this is, this just, um, makes a lot of sense. So, um, Mirta? 
Um, I was going to say the same thing. I am supportive of, of annexing this in. I think it makes sense. Um, I just know that I'm trying to uh, predict the future here a little bit and know that there's going to be some concerns about traffic. Um, this is pretty close, if I'm correct, to um, where uh, the KOA and Hellgate Transportation uh, takes in and out all the buses. Uh, there's another development, I think, a couple of... Um, a couple of lots to the east. Um, so a lot going on. And I just know that uh, we just gotta be better prepared to handle the growth. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have that growth. That, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we need to move on to our next item. Is there any, um, are there any additional comments or questions about this? Okay, so again, this is just no action today. Um, we'll have this back for final consideration um, on um, Monday night. So thank you everyone um, for the time and um, to the applicant team for joining us today and we'll see you Monday. Um, and I have so many tabs open that they are no longer labeled. So I'm going to try to find the agenda. Here we go. Um, so our um, the, the balance of our meeting uh, will be spent on the um, the marijuana land use regulation um, revision white paper. Um, there's a um, whole team of people in in CPDI who have been working on this, um, and um, and I'm really um, it's a and the, the white paper is a really um, comprehensive um, look into um, some of the issues that we may face um, as. Um, as uh, House Bill 701 uh, takes effect and we start seeing recreational marijuana um, uh, facilities or, or retail establishments or other types of uses in our in our community. Um, so um, Spencer and Cassie and and Madsen and Ben um, and, and others have been working on this um, and um, and I, I hope everyone's had a chance to review it. Um, but um, today we'll um, present the white paper and um, talk about um, regula regulatory opportunities um, ahead of us. Um, we, have a, we have a pretty compressed timeline to have to, to adopt any regulations that would take effect um, before January 1st. Um, but um, this is um, the opportunity to um, get, have a committee discussion and get some feedback on the sorts of issues that, um, that people would like to see regulated. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, um, I'm not sure who's, who's kicking this off. Um, Spencer, your name's on the referral. Are you are you leading off on this, or? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna make some opening remarks here and, and kind of set this up and then um, pass it off to to uh, Spencer and, and Cassie here. Um, Thanks, man. And, uh, <clears throat> Will Spencer's uh, putting up the presentation. I'll uh, just want to um, uh, introduce our our team and talk about. Um, what we're we're aiming for here, um, we're this is uh, basically uh, um, looking to update our land use regulations uh, with regard to uh, marijuana uses. Um, since the the recent um, ballot initiative was was passed and bill was produced um, to allow for recreational marijuana use um, in the state, and uh, so um, a team of us in in CPDI have been working on this um, and uh, collaboratively um, together, but I especially wanna um, uh, thank and, and uh, give credit to uh, Cassie and, and Trapard, Spencer Stark and Mad Madison Mathias for um, doing a, a ton of research and, and work to um, wrap our heads around, around this and, and um, uh, put together a starting point for how we want to approach this from the local level. Um, so just to give a quick kind of context before I pass this off, um, you know, as, as most of you probably know that the, the um, state has allowed for medical marijuana use for quite some time now, I think originally starting somewhere in, in 2004, that's when the first initiative was passed. And since then there, there's been kind of a back and forth on how that has been, um, administered and allowed for and, and enforced and, and everything, but it's been um, contained to uh, medical marijuana use specifically. Um, and last year, the uh, um, there was a, a new ballot initiative that um, 
called for uh, legalization of recreational or, or what's called adult use um, in the bill, I think. But that um, and so um, this is a, a recent change for the state and um, the um, legis legislature um, passed a bill to address that and and um, implement it um, in the last legislative session. Um, and so that that is uh, what we are responding to. And the bill basically encourages local governments to begin to integrate um, our marijuana business categories into into the new state regulations and and update um, our regulations locally. So um, that's our task here. Our, our, our team has been um, looking into and, and our own um, regulations with regard to how we've done things in the past um, for medical marijuana use and, and then also has been really digging into the bill itself and researching how other um, places have responded to this kind of legislation um, elsewhere in the state and, and outside in, in other states around the country um, and really put a lot of um, uh, time and, and thought into this. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's our starting point that we are bringing to you today to propose um, what we think are, are, you know, a reasonable and, and uh, responsible um, set of code amendments that, that will address um, uh, future impacts, you know, of this, of this new bill here in Missoula. And the last thing I, I just want to um, kind of set up for you as, as you listen to uh, Cassie and, and Spencer's presentation is to, you know, we, as Jordan said, we really are on um, a, a pretty tight timeline here. And so part of what we want to do today is really get a sense from, um, from you, whether um, we're on the right track, whether we're addressing um, issues that, um, that should be addressed, or if there's anything that we're, we're not addressing, uh, we aren't addressing that we should be that, that we're missing um, and really get a sense that we're on um, that that this is the direction we should head in so with that I'll, I'll pass it over to Spencer thank you thank you Ben uh, as Ben stated uh, within the last year starting in November of 2020 voters approved initiative uh, 190 which directed state legislatures to draft and adopt House Bill 701, legalizing adult, adult use recreational marijuana in the state of Montana. As part of this, uh, as part of House Bill 701, um, the legislature directed the Department of Revenue to draft license, licensing rules for uh, adult use med, uh, recreational marijuana on October 1st, 2021. So those are forthcoming. This is to facilitate the uh, implementation of a legalized marijuana, allowing for existing medical businesses licensed before November 2020 to apply for recreational business licenses before July 1st, 2023, when recreational business licenses will be available to the general public. And by recreational business licenses, meaning cultivation, um, dispensary licenses, manufacturing licenses, as well as a few, uh, a few more obscure licenses. Currently, there are 70, um, approximately 70 marijuana related businesses within the city of Missoula. 50 of those are dispensary uh, businesses um, and the remaining 20 are split between cultivators, manufacturers and mixed use businesses, meaning uh, a combination of cultivation, uh, dispensary, or manufacturing use, uses, as well as testing. Cassie, you're on mute you're, there. Yeah. Thought something seemed wrong. All right, thank you. Um, after researching the land use impacts of marijuana related uses, staff were able to categorize these impacts into three main concerns that can be mitigated through zoning code. Staff decided the impacts do not vary between medical and recreational, so they are treated the same for consistency in our recommendations. Staff evaluated known marijuana land use impacts on public health and safety. Fewer public health and safety concerns were identified with retail sales than with cultivation and manufacturing uses. Marijuana product manufacturing uses are more likely to utilize chemical extractants and heat and pressure. 
Cultivation requires proper ventilation, attention to humidity to prevent mold, and proper disposal of wastewater and solid waste. Additionally, cultivation is energy intensive and often requires electrical work prior to occupying the space. Marijuana uses have the potential to impact neighborhood character. Marijuana uses include dispensaries, cultivation, and manufacturing of marijuana products, as well as a couple other more obscure uses. Uh, each of the business activities impacts surrounding neighborhoods differently. For example, a retail dispensary is better suited for commercial areas with other retail businesses, mixed use developments and similar structure form, whereas manufacturing of marijuana products is likely to produce impacts more suited for industrial areas away from commercial corridors and residences. Staff will also address how commercial cultivation within homes is likely to impact residential character. Uh, the map of existing businesses on the previous slide showed saturation of dispensaries within certain areas, more particularly downtown near the intersection of West Broadway and Russell and a portion of Brook Street. Uh, if dispensaries continue to cluster, they will lead to a lack of diverse uses in a particular neighborhood, affecting urban form and access to amenities. Additionally, to obscure marijuana products and provide security, many dispensaries have installed frosted glass or otherwise opaque windows. This causes a lack of storefront transparency. Active transparent storefronts create a relationship between the public street and private business spaces. They also provide visual interest to people walking down uh, the street. And frosted glass inhibits the storefront activation, which alters urban form. Next slide. So the 2035 our Missoula City Growth Policy is the guiding regional plan for the city of Missoula. Zoning regulations aim to implement the goals and vision of the growth policy. So the impacts were analyzed and then compared with the growth policy goals to shape zoning code revision recommendations. Uh, the recommended revisions address impacts in alignment with the goals of the growth policy. So goals relating to neighborhood character promote neighborhood accessibility to amenities and services, support efforts that diversify the base economy, and identify appropriate locations for industrial uses. These goals can be implemented by appropriately defining and zoning marijuana related uses and limiting saturation of retail dispensaries to promote access to a mix of neighborhood services. The growth policy aims to maintain the unique identity of downtown Missoula while maintaining quality development. Additionally, a diverse base economy is essential to all commercial areas. These goals relate to protecting quality urban form, including active commercial storefronts and promoting access to diverse uses. Additionally, urban form can be protected by identifying the form of each marijuana related use and permitting them in locations where the use aligns with the neighborhood context. Uh, lastly, goal 1.16 of the growth policy calls to identify best, practice for, best practices for implementing crime prevent, prevention through environmental design. And I'll explain this concept in more detail in a later slide, but it goes along with promoting visual connections between public and private spaces to improve public safety. And uh, public health and safety isn't well addressed by the growth policy because it's backed up by zoning and addressed throughout you know, most city policies and regulations as a primary goal and sort of uh, primary function of government. In response to this uh, uh, research and uh, looking at and forecasting the impact, staff has proposed four recommendations to amend Title 20 in response to the legalization of adult use recreational marijuana. Um, the first of these is to align Title 20 with state uses as outlined in House Bill 701. These uses include cultivation, retail dispensaries, manufacturing, as well as transportation and testing. Cultivation in this context is the um, growing and harvesting of marijuana. Um, staff has identified cultivation as a manufacturing use and has further divided them across three subclasses of manufacturing based upon the canopy area um, as defined and presented in House Bill 701. In this context, canopy area is the square footage of the plants. This includes any structures, um, uh, pedestals, or su support structures. Staff is proposing that micro and tier one canopy area cultivators 
um, which correlates to a canopy area of 1,000 square feet, be considered an art, artisan manufacturing use. Uh, this would allow be allowed. This use would be allowed conditionally in B1 and B2 districts, and permitted outright in B3 districts, all commercial districts, and all manufacturing and industrial districts. Furthermore, um, uh, staff has proposed to classify tier two cultiv cultivation, which allows for canopy areas between 1,001 square feet and 2,500 square feet as a limited manufacturing use. This would be allowed conditionally in the B3 district and permitted outright in the commercial districts and manufacturing and industrial districts. Finally, uh, tier three through 12 um, canopies would be uh, considered a general manufacturing use and would uh, account for those canopy areas between 2,501 square feet and 50,000 square feet. These would be permitted in our limited and heavy industrial zone districts. Retail dispensaries um, would be considered general retail as proposed by staff and would be allowed in all business, commercial and industrial districts. The manufacturing use, which um, is the processing of marijuana uh, products, um, namely uh, concentrates with the use of solvents as previously mentioned by Cassie, would be considered a general manufacturing use and would be permitted in the limited industrial and heavy industrial zone districts. Finally, uh, there are some uh, miscellaneous uh, use classes such as tra transportation and testing. Staff is, is not recommending any changes to Title 20 to address these uses as, they are sufficient, as staff believes that they are sufficiently covered in the existing use classifications. Transportation is uh, well um, accommodated by the uh, wholesale freight and shipping use classification and testing is um, well accommodated by the research services use classification. So no changes pro proposed for those two um, use classes. This map illustrates the areas of the city of Missoula where dispensaries and micro, -tier, micro and tier one cultivations would be permitted uh, per staff's proposal um, with the caveat that uh, B1 and B2 districts would require conditional approval for micro and tier one cultivation. This map illustrates where tier, tier two cultivation would be permitted, again, with the caveat that B3, um, that tier two cultivations in the B3 uh, district would require conditional approval. Finally, tier three and up um, cultivation would be permitted in limited and in in heavy industrial zone districts as illustrated on the map shown on the slide. Okay, so on to our first recommendation or second recommendation. Uh, staff recommend prohibiting commercial marijuana cultivation as a home occupation. And to clarify, this does not include cultivation for personal use permitted by state law. Uh, we're not recommending to handle that with zoning. This is just for people growing commercially with the intent to sell the product. Uh, home occupation is when a person gets a business license to operate their business out of the residency they live in, also known as home-based businesses. Because these are residential homes, the business must be accessory or subordinate to the use of the structure as a residence. Title 20, Section 4550 regulates home occupations. The current ordinance states that home occupations which alter the residential character of the property are not permitted. Additionally, home occupations that produce uh, noise or odor are not permitted. The smallest cultivation tier, the micro tier, uh, in the state regulations allows for a maximum of 250 square feet of canopy area. And the micro tier in tier one permits a cultivation operation that may be too large to be deemed insubordinate to the use of the structure as a home, which is not consistent with the intent of the home occupation standards. Uh, cultivation is energy intensive and produces waste products and wastewater. Commercial and industrial locations are often better suited to accommodate the electrical and waste needs of cultivation operations. Building standards do not adequately address public health and safety concerns uh, for home-based cultivation and are more difficult to enforce at residential locations, uh, specifically in relation to proper ventil 
ventilation, safe electrical setup, and prevention of mold. Currently, uh, there are permitted medical marijuana cultivation home occupations in Missoula, though not very many. These would be considered legal non-conforming if council votes to prohibit cultivation home occupations, meaning they could continue operating until the business is intentionally abandoned at the location. Next slide. Sorry. No problem. Thirdly, staff is proposing um, in response, as part of um, drafting up these recommendations, staff received several uh, concerns regarding the overconcentration of marijuana businesses in any one location in the city of Missoula, um, namely the concentration of dispensaries. Um, in response to this, staff researched um, some methodologies to control against the overconcentration of dispensaries in one area. Um, the resulting recommendation is a 500 foot buffer from other marijuana retail uses. This is an, um, reflects the 500 foot buffer for schools and places of worship implemented uh, within HB 701 for marijuana related uses. The uh, buffer is intended to allow for dispensaries to be located wherever retail um, uses are permitted, but to avoid any one area of Missoula being inundated with dispensaries. Um, alternatively, or in addition to uh, a buffer, several municipalities and states have implemented a cap on the number of dispensaries that would be allowed. Um, that is an alternative to what staff is proposing. However, staff's uh, 500 foot buffer in combination with the limited area uh, where retail uses can be established would function as a de facto cap to with the finite space uh, retail spaces available for dispensaries. Um, in, in addition, and as a, as a side note, existing dispensaries would be considered legal non-conforming and would be treated similar to other non-conforming uses uh, in Title 20, which is to say that they would be permitted to uh, to continue operation until such a time in which they terminate operation at that location. Okay, so to obscure marijuana products and improve security, dispensaries around Missoula have been installing frosted glass windows or otherwise obscuring view from the public street. This damages the connection between the public street and sidewalk and private businesses along the street because it acts sort of like a blank wall. Active transparent storefronts provide visual interest for people walking by, and these storefront displays are an important part of downtown Missoula's character and urban form. They are also promoted by city policies like design excellence. Crime prevention through environmental design is a report on best practices stating that when more people are able to see outside from inside a home or business and vice versa, overall safety is improved. The diagram shows how active building frontages with windows, balconies, and frequent entries allows for passive interaction um, between the building and the street. Essentially, people are less likely to commit crime when people inside of uh, surrounding buildings can see out onto the street. It also allows more people to notice potential accidents on the street and call for help. Uh, staff are concerned that as the number of dispensaries increases in Missoula, the connection between building frontages and public spaces will be diminished by opaque windows. Next slide. So currently design excellence requires a certain percentage of windows on the street facing facades. Um, the window requirement is paired with the requirement that windows be at least 60% transparent to promote these active frontages. This requirement only applies in the design excellence overlay, which is uh, applicable to downtown and major commercial corridors. However, not all business, commercial, and industrial zone parcels are included in the overlay, which means they do not have to comply with this requirement. Uh, for parcels in the design excellence overlay, staff will enforce this requirement by offering alternative methods to obscure products. These methods include, but are not limited to, creating a lobby area in the front of the shop before entering the retail area, uh, changes to the floor plans to obscure products while accommodating glazing transparency should be an expectation. Design excellence requires that no walls be installed within six feet of the glazing, which prevents people from building walls right behind the glass. 
And you can see that some of the businesses in the previous photos are within design excellence, but don't meet the requirements. Uh, these windows were installed without staff knowledge and didn't go through zoning review. So staff will rectify this issue in the future by notifying applicants of the requirements at business license and building permits. And we'll co coordinate our licensing procedures more effectively. For areas outside of the design excellence corridor, there is a requirement to add a certain percentage of windows to new construction. However, the code just prohibits tinted and reflective glass. It doesn't address frosted glass and doesn't provide specific transparency requirements like design excellence does. Um, staff recommend either amending this section to require specific transparency requirements for all new commercial buildings, um, not exceeding 30,000 square feet, um, or creating a new use and building specific standard section for dispensaries and marijuana related uses. This section could require window transparency, a specific number, and touch on other urban form related items, for example, the prohibition of dispensary drive throughs and state law. Alternatives to frosted glass will be recommended by staff, like uh, within, you know, same as design excellence. The current section for commercial uses only applies to new construction. So if we would like to prevent existing buildings from installing opaque windows, a specific section for dispensaries and marijuana uses will need to be added to the use and building specific section. The timeline for implementing these four uh, recommendations, if uh, so directed by the Land Use and Planning Committee, is as follows. Um, there will be a city council consent agenda item to set the public hearing in November on the 15th. And that uh, consent agenda item would be on the September 20 city council agenda. A special presentation to the planning board would be prepared for October 19th to introduce the um, provisions of the ordinance and uh, receive initial feedback from the planning board. On November 1st, city council would um, receive the first reading of the ordinance as a consent agenda item, followed by a planning board public hearing on November 2nd, and the pre-public hearing in front of LUP on November 10th, a public hearing in front of city council on November 15th, and a final consideration on November 29th, uh, allowing the 30-day um, period between the final consideration and the uh, adoption or the um, implementation of the new ordinance before January 1st, 2022. Um, in summary, staff is recommending that uh, Title 20 be amended to align with state definitions by updating the land use classifications to include marijuana uses and to pro prohibit commercial cultivation as home occupations and to preserve a diverse mix of uses by implementing a 500 feet buffer between dispensaries and to limit non-transparent glazing um, uh, to encourage street front activation. Staff is recommending the following motion that the land use and planning committee direct community planning development innovation to prepare, to prepare an ordinance amending title 20, the city of Missoula zoning code in alignment with the presented HB 701 1613 MCA white paper and set public here and set public hearing process with a November 2nd, 2021 public hearing at the planning board and a November 15th, 2021 public hearing at city council. This concludes staff's presentation. Staff is available for question um, at this time. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all. That was um, a really informative presentation. Um, I have a queue of people starting here. Um, uh, I guess maybe just a quick procedural question. Um, I, I, um, I think that um, we'll we'll um, likely move forward with this with this motion and and you know following the committee discussion. But um, just what's most useful as far as as far as feedback from the committee as you refine um, what would go into the code? Um, do you want? Um, do you want specific? I, I'll I'll leave it at that for now. Like what what what's the most useful kind of feedback you? You can you can get. Um, I, I, I can start. Go, go, go ahead, ahead Ben. No, you got it. Uh, I'll, I'll just start and then yeah, um, fill in what I what I missed. But I, I think you know, looking back at that timeline that uh, Spencer just walked through, we are um, looking at you know rolling out a draft ordinance um, by late October, 
And um, so when we when we do that, it, it kind of um, uh, sets the sets the course for what that ordinance contains if we're gonna um, stay in this timeline. And so I, I think what our hope is for this is that we, we anticipate some kind of a amended um, um, uh, I'm totally blanking on the, the motion. The, uh, motion, thank you. Uh, so some kind of an amended motion to consider whatever conversation comes out of this and, and um, which will direct you know what we, um, some specifics of what, how we address the issues that we presented um, in this and, and potentially, you know, expand on what we've, we've brought here. But um, so um, what, what that, that, I think that's what we're, we're aiming for is, is a, you know, if, if there's any um, additions or amendments to what we're bringing today, that there would be a um, amendment to the motion to, to move forward, considering the conversation that comes out of this. Um, Cassie, do you have anything to add to that? I think that summed it up really well, just knowing if, you know, we should move forward with all four recommendations, if there's tweaks anyone would like to see to them or slight changes or, you know, maybe some recommendations you don't find appropriate at all. Um, just knowing moving forward which course we should take. Okay, so with all that in mind, uh, we'll go through the queue and we can do questions and comments. Um, and if anyone has anything that they think should deviate from the white paper and from the presentation, um, then maybe make that known and we can um, we can have votes or discussion as needed on that. Um, um, so um, I've got a, a queue going. Amber's up first and then followed by Heather. Yeah, thanks. And thank you um, for the presentation and this thorough review. review. Um, I'm thinking about is your first number, I think, was that there were 70 businesses. I don't know if they're dispensaries exactly in Missoula right now. Um, and then I started thinking about that buffer or cap idea. If we do the 500 foot buffer or a cap, um, which led me to then think about what House Bill 701's wording was, because you mentioned that that it went through the county commissioners to approve it in, in Missoula as well. So I'm just curious, like is the way it's written, could you know Florence say, no, we don't want any of these, therefore pushing kind of all the business to Missoula, could French, well, French Town's the county, but um, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious how it's written and how you came up with buffer versus cap. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about like, are we going to get a flood of this from every place around us? And um, yeah, could you just speak to that a little bit? Yes. Uh, so to clarify, the the it was the residents of the Missoula County voted overwhelmingly to approve the HB 701. Just to add a little clarity there. And then looking at the state, um, so. House Bill 701 allows for recreational marijuana uses in those counties that have that voted to approve House Bill 701 and provides a separate procedure for counties that did not approve House uh, Initiative I-90, sorry, or 190 to go through a, a procedure to hold a vote. Um, but it's a, the adoption of adult use marijuana within counties that did vote to approve uh, I-190 do not need to go through a, a secondary approval procedure. Um, that being said, all the counties around Missoula County adjacent to Missoula County voted to approve uh, Initiative 190. Um, we did take that into account when factoring in a cap. Um, in addition, the buffer seemed like a more attractive option because it would allow for businesses to still be located throughout our commercial and um, business districts uh, while controlling for those, uh, the impacts of what a lot of retail dispensaries may bring. And that's namely what we've uh, presented in our presentation, which is deactivating street frontage, frontages and um, not preserving those diverse mixture of uses. As we uh, began this process, we, we did consult with a few um, individuals throughout the community, but raised concerns, over, especially that over-concentration of uh, 
dispensaries, namely within the downtown, but then other districts as well. So that, that was the impetus for, for a buffer. And then using that 500 foot uh, buffer provided by the state uh, seemed like a, a, a good way with a clear precedent for mitigating against impacts of surrounding uses. Thank you. And can I just follow that up too, just, just for context that the county is also um, in the process of developing their own you know, county regulations um, to address this. And, you know, we are working or, you know, doing our, our best to coordinate with them, um, given the, the, the timelines that we're working in. Um, I'm taking over for Jordan briefly. Um, and I just really quickly wanted to add uh, that in discussions leading up to this, I think we didn't want to replicate what we see happening with the liquor licenses, um, which is that, you know, they s sell for over a million dollars and are largely unattainable, um, and it's not a great system. And so um, making a cap just could create issues, economic issues in the long run too. Um, but Jordan's back. So I'll let him back. <laughs> keep going. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for highlighting that too, Heidi. That's it. Um, and, and also, Spencer, your point about, you know, the voters, the voters approved this by an overwhelming margin. And so I, I think um, having having a really light regulatory touch and, and focusing on Health and safety and nuisance um, and and those neighborhood character issues um, is um, an appropriate approach. Um, Amber, do you have any additional questions? I don't. Thank you. Okay, um, Heather, and then Julie. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, you know, I think to your point, Jordan. I think you're absolutely right. This is as light of a touch as we can possibly apply here. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could just kind of recap again. Um, when, when, when you have a, a dispensary that is using frosted glass today, um, what measures are gonna, are, will you be taking to try and um, convert those back to regular glass, if you will? Is there a mechanism in place or, or are we just kind of let those go and then just moving forward, new license uh, applicants will be required for um, non-frost, non-frosted glass? staff have kind of been debating that moving forward absolutely it'll be more thoroughly enforced um traditionally with non-compliances we do have a complaint-based system we don't normally do a lot of active enforcement but that's something that we could turn over to code compliance to bring them into compliance with the regulations okay. thank you appreciate it cassie um thanks heather uh julie and then gwen um, I have a concern about this in particular to Ward 6. Uh, Catlin Street is um, designated as commercial use, which means that we could uh, potentially put a manu manufacturing, if I've got this correctly, um, within two blocks of Franklin Elementary School. And I'm that's disturbing for me. And so I'm wondering if there's uh, some ways that we could be a little more surgical with some of that, because I do really think that we need to try and um, protect those areas, especially around elementary and our middle schools. And, you know, CS Porter falls into the same thing, being right there on yeah. Reserve Street. Um, you, you, could have, you could have a dispensary going across the street from the middle school, which I think would be really problematic. So in state law, and this isn't something we felt the need to reiterate in local zoning code, state law prohibits or places a 500 buffer on uh, marijuana uses from schools and places of worship. So that's already built into state licensing. They wouldn't license something right across the street or within 500 feet from that school. As far as I'm trying to bring up the area on Catlin you're looking at, it looks like it's zoned C1-4, um, that wouldn't allow the, you know, manufacturing of products, but would allow dispensaries, and I believe cultivation tiers uh, one and two, and the micro tiers. Okay. So. Um, okay, and that's what I was thinking of was cultivation. Um, okay. Yeah, and that's, I mean, Catlin is a little bit of an unusual situation that it's, that it is zoned commercial, but it's all residential currently pretty much. I mean, there's, 
I don't know, there's home-based businesses and stuff in there. But when you drive down that street, you would not think that you were in a commercial zoning district. Mm -hmm. um, I had one other uh, just kind of housekeeping issue. I don't understand in the reference that you guys are making to MCA. You said 16.13 MCA, and there's no six, Title 16, Section 13 in MCA. I think it's maybe it's Title 16, Section 12. Oh, yeah, you're correct. Okay. So, we will and that, and that 16.13 MCA, that's not usually the way we, we um, reference the MCA code. I don't know. So that's just clerical. That's all I got. Yeah, we'll Thank make you. sure to probably state that right in the motion. Probably just a typo of hitting the wrong button. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I would be curious if there's any. Um, Catlin is an interesting case, and I'd be curious if there are any, um, if if any other areas come to mind for staff about um, similar characters of neighborhood that have. Um, that are that have a mismatch zoning in that in that way, um, and maybe it's not a question for right now. But if, if anyone, um, if if there's a way to look into that, that's not too onerous. That'd be interesting. Um, next, uh, Gwen, and then Heidi. Thank you. Um, thanks for all of the great information today, and uh, specifically regarding recommendations three and four. I wanted to say that yes, I think those are super important, and I. I think Heidi brings up a good point regarding the cap, um, but what I wanted to first of all talk about is just the our hip strip and downtown have already had a huge impact by stores coming in. Um, and for decades, people have worked so hard to create a vibrant downtown and millions and millions of dollars has been invest have been invested in our downtown area. And in the space of 12 to 18 months, we're just seeing a huge dramatic change in the entire vibe downtown with the marijuana stores that are going in that are basically front loading as medical prior to the January start date of recreational. So I have been hearing from a lot of people and I really appreciate um, a lot of people regarding this issue and great concern regarding it. And I, I don't think the issue is having marijuana recreational stores, I think the issue is the impact on the downtown and hip strip. My, my goal is I think they, it, I think we need a bigger buffer and that's what I'm hoping staff will can do some analysis on during this next uh, few weeks. Um, right now with a 500 buffer, 500 foot buffer, for the most part, it can be every block, every once in a while, it's gonna skip a block. And frankly, I think we should, we should, that's too close. And there are already so many downtown. Um, we need to space it out a lot more. So I'm not quite sure what that number is, but in my mind, I'm thinking every third block having a store would be much better. Um, and I really want to disperse these across Missoula and not just have them downtown and at the hip strip. I think they need to be dispersed and that a bigger buffer would create that incentive. Um, so I'm going to put that out there for staff to chew on, and I'm also going to make a note to myself. Um, I think Linda M McCarthy from the Missoula Downtown Association needs to be uh, brought into this conversation regarding how to keep a vibrant downtown that accommodates this industry, but that doesn't have all of these dead streetscapes. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how you're going to tackle the frosted glass issue, but I agree. I mean, for me, storefront windows can be public art in so many different forms, and there's got to be a creative way of using that to um, serve all sorts of great purposes, collaborating with other entities or whatever. Um, and if it still has to be screened, the transaction, I'm sure that can be accommodated. So I think we need to set up a scenario where people are incentivized to get creative, and we could have a way better streetscape in the long run. Um, but right now, just seeing a lot of uh, frosted glass is not great. So I don't know if staff wants to talk to me later on to crystallize this a little bit, but I think we need to really up the 500 buffer. So I'm just gonna put that out there. 
Yeah, and I have one note at that. There was a point where we looked at a thousand foot buffer, but after sort of measuring downtown, we realized that would only allow, you know, two or so businesses going from sort of the southwest corner to the northwest or northeast along Higgins. So we found that of maybe a bit too limiting with what was already there, maybe not allowing it wouldn't allow any more businesses, but there could be sort of a sweet spot between maybe 500 and 1000. Great. And I think east west should also be analyzed also It's I'm looking at the entire downtown and I think we should be able to have some charting saying with X amount of feet as a buffer. This is what we could be looking at. So it I think anyway, and I'll pull some other good people in on this conversation who could contribute, but I'm sorry, I feel like I cut cut you off Spencer. Um, I wanted to clarify, uh, perhaps the the. Um the illustration uh, did not do the buffer principle justice. Uh, the buffer would be measured as a radius. So it would be with the business point being in the center, it would be a circular 500 foot radius around that. So if we were applied to a block face, it would move through the block face and would likely uh, touch um, further out than just this linear measurement illustrates. And I can uh, draft up some better illustrations to demonstrate that principle um, for you. So that as we look at um, you know, the differences in 500 to 1,000 to maybe somewhere in between, we can get a good sense of what that that will look like when applied. That'd be great. I think it's just, we just have to figure out the right balance to strike and we'll, we'll be where we wanna be. Thank you. Thank on you. that note, I wonder if there's a way to, to do some kind of GIS analysis of um, of how many um, how many retail establishments would be allowed um, in a given zone or in a in a given geography um, based on certain sizes of of that of that radius. Um, I mean, effectively, a, a a 500 foot limit or a thousand foot limit or whatever it is is effectively a citywide cap. It just is a it just is in a different um, it's it's using a different metric or a different a different um, tool. So it'd be interesting if we had a way to, to, to analyze that and just determine how many would be allowed and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, I can definitely talk to um, our GIS planner. There is a buffering tool in GIS that we can use. Um, can even use starting dispensaries to, you know, as a starting point with buffers around those, show if more can be added. And then more generally, if you just look at how many of those circles can fit within downtown or other commercial spaces before you run out of room. So that's something yeah. we can definitely look into. That'd be great, thanks. Um, next up, um, Heidi and then Julie. So I just had a, a comment on the presentation itself. I think we definitely should include the information that's in the state law, even though it isn't. Um, something that we're integrating into zoning code that refers to the 500 foot um, buffer zone around schools and um, places of worship. I think that uh, just communicates more clearly what the actual like implications are on our community. Um, and, oh, I had a second thing. I can't remember. I'll raise my hand again, okay. Um, Julie. Yeah, that brings up all kinds of questions for me. So if when you guys are um, giving us some visual examples of what that 500 foot buffer between dispensaries or between, you know, buildings looks like, um, I, I wonder if you could also give us some visual about what that 500 foot buffer from a school or a, a place of worship is. I mean, is it from the middle of the school parcel, for example, or from the edge of the school parcel. Um, I, that just brings up all kinds of questions for me. And yeah. then I had another one and it just slipped my mind. Spencer, do you know if it's a centroid or it's from the entry or something like that? Oh, you're muted. I believe it's the, so, Dispensaries are limited to one customer entrance uh, per state law. And I believe they'll measure from there because that's the point of impact, I guess. Um, yeah, but so what I'm I, asking about is where you measure when it's a school. Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. So I'll, but we'll follow up and get those uh, visuals to in the, the next round of presentations. Yeah. And we'll know there it is from like entries and so forth, but there are some limitations to GIS and plotting the actual points and finding each school entry. Um, so it might be, you know, a few feet off if we have to use a centroid for the visual representation, but we'll make sure to clarify exactly where it's measured from. Uh, yeah, so that, thank you. That would be really helpful. I guess the other thing that I was thinking of is what happens when a place of worship um, comes into, like I'm at the... Sheck Church is in the process of um, remodeling the Coca-Cola plant on Third Street. And, and so at what point in time does that become um, a building that would get a 500 foot buffer around it? Question. That's a good question. Um, I believe it, there would, if the retail establishment is already established, it would um, continue to exist until similar to our non-conforming section. Um, and then the, once the church is, receives it, like functioning uh, clearance to um, uh, operate, I guess it would be considered established and therefore no new dispensaries within that 500 foot buffer would be allowed by the state. I, th I think this is a, a good point to also, you know, let, let you know, communicate our, our, the approach we've, we've been under the assumption of, of moving forward with is that we were not intending to replicate um, state law um, standards um, that are in the bill um, into into our zoning. Um, so the which is kind of how we which is basically how we operate now. There's a prohibition of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries from being within a certain distance of schools, um, but it's not it's not our regulation. It's regulated by the state, and and so you know there's there's different reasons for, for why, you know, why to let them handle um, those, the, or monitor for those regulations and, or whether to, to kind of add in redundancies in our own zoning. But the, uh, our assumption was that those would um, already be, be monitored for and, and reviewed for during the state licensing um, process. Um, and that we wouldn't also kind of migrate them over into our zoning. So there's some other, and there's some other things like that, like a pro prohibition of, of drive-throughs um, and um, you know, there are other things I'm, like, I'm not thinking of right now, but um, just to communicate to you that, you know, that's the general approach that we were operating under. And, um, you know, if there was something where, where we, the, the idea was to expand on what the state requirement is, you know, a thousand feet buffer instead of 500 um, between schools and, and facilities, then, then that's something, you know, we would, we would incorporate and add into our own regulations. But so I just wanted to clarify on that. And it looks like Jim uh, may have thoughts on this as well. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. Sure. I just want to note uh, for the committee and for the staff, because I know they don't have the law with them. House Bill 701 is within 500 feet of and on the same street of the church or synagogue measured entrance to entrance. So they measure, <clears throat> excuse me, they measure on the same street from the church entrance or the school entrance to the entrance of the marijuana type business. You are allowed to have a greater distance. The state law allows local government to have a greater distance than 500 feet. I suspect that probably will have, still have to be measured from entrance to entrance, but that's not clear. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I don't have anyone else in the queue. Um, Heidi. Sorry, so slow to get my hand up. Um, I remember what my second thing was. It was on the, um, I guess, the fourth uh, recommendation, which is to limit non-transparent glass. And while I recognize that this white paper is specific to um, marijuana uses, I think if we're going to revisit that, I don't, um, 
I don't know why it would need to be specific to marijuana uses. I think are having an active down, you know, active pedestrian people space applies to any sort of use. And so I think um, it would be a great opportunity to just expand that across uses, um, you know, and just not limiting it to this. Uh, and I, I fully support it. Um, I just think we shouldn't be narrow about how we implement it. Yeah. Do you mind if I ask just a follow-up question? So that the one section for all commercial, you know, uses across town, um, that applies to new construction where we definitely could add it to there. But then um, if we wanted to go back to say, prevent it in existing buildings, it may need to be more specific to this use. Well, and or I, I, to all, maybe it could go in there with something that just limits existing as well. Yeah, I was thinking any use, even, you know, if you're a new business coming in and remodeling um, and you're pulling a building permit, say, to do that remodel um, in an existing building, I think that would be a good opportunity to, um, I guess, engage on this issue. So I, I was thinking of it in both new construction and existing buildings whenever there's maybe a, a building permit pulled or something. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're out of time. Um, we can, um, um, oh, we have, um, we have Jenny Dixon in the um, attendees and Jenny's hand is up. I'm, Jenny, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. Give me just a moment. Okay. Hi, hey, thank Hi. you so much. I, um, I understand you're out of time. So um, I wasn't sure if you were gonna take public comment at this point or since you were gonna make a motion, but I just, first of all, I wanted to compliment city staff for the amazing amount of work they've done and the thoroughness. I wanted to make the city, uh, this committee, uh, as well as the council aware of so another aspect that the county is looking at in terms of regulation of um, marijuana cultivation. And our um, focus is also going to include energy conservation measures that uh, our research, research has shown um, cultivation uh, activity consumes seven to eight times more than an average commercial use. And the county is interested in, um, in our, our carbon neutral goals, uh, taking a look at that. So I just wanted to make the, the committee aware of that aspect as well, that um, may not be within the scope of this project for the city, but um, just wanted to let you know about it and answer any questions you might have. Yeah, that's great, Jenny, I appreciate that. And um, and I know that that um, you all have been talking, uh, um, the, the st county staff and city staff, but it, I, I would love to learn more about that and whether that's something that um, that we can do in this phase or, or consider for future um, adoption. Um, it's a great idea. So, Heather? So along those lines, um, is something that we, we could be looking at right now just in terms of incentives to reduce uh, um, energy consumption? Or is that perhaps penciled for a future reiteration of this? Um, I, I guess I'll share what, when we had discussed uh, energy, energy consumption and the related impacts, uh, that's while the, it is an impact present in marijuana cultivation, it's also an impact present in other industries. Um, and so there was an overarching, at, at least from my understanding, an overarching framework for energy consumption uh, would need to be developed um, to treat marijuana uses in isolation may not be, um, uh, may not be per, uh, appropriate, I, I, perhaps that's the verbiage, but, um, but looking at energy con consumption uh, across industries instead of just isolated to this one would be primarily why it wouldn't be concerned at, or considered at, or presented on at Thanks. this time. Sandra? Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late to this. I um, was rocking my brain whether I wanted to comment it or not, but I have to disagree with um, my colleague Heidi there on um, whether we should 
um, not allow opaque glass on any business in the area. Um, I, I disagree with uh, not allowing opaque glass for the marijuana business. And I also definitely disagree with it um, for any business. Um, I think that it should be the, uh, the business's right to be able to protect their customers' privacy no matter what business it is. So I would rather not in include that on a um, for a, an actual um, requirement for the downtown area. Uh, just wanted to give my two cents there. And I'll note, it's already in the code that it's required for downtown. What we're proposing is expanding that, and it's required also anywhere Design Excellent is, so main corridors, and we're um, recommending expanding that to all other kind of commercial uses outside of Design Excellence, just to clarify. Oh, okay. I appreciate that clarification. Um, I still disagree with it, but I really appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we are out of time. Um, I think um, I'm happy to stick around if folks want to continue to talk, but I think we should um, get a motion on the floor and, and get it approved so that anyone who wants to depart can. Um, and um, uh, so, Heather, your hand is up. Would you? I would be happy to put the motion on the floor for you, Jordan. Okay. Thank you. That motion is in order. Um, any additional discussion on the motion at this point, Sandra? Uh, like I just mentioned, um, I, I disagree with uh, the frosted glass. I also disagree with um, dictating on what businesses can buy property and where. Um, I really do appreciate um, Julie's questions on the uh, school regulations um, in the school zones. I do appreciate that because I, I do agree that you shouldn't have marijuana shops within a certain distance between within um, school districts and um, places of worship. Uh, but I, I, I think I, I disagree with this. Yeah, I do disagree with this uh, motion, so I'm going to vote no at this time. Okay, um, thanks for thanks for clarifying that. Um, and this uh, this will come back. I mean, this is there. This is directing staff to, to write the the, the proposed regulations, um, and so of course there's opportunities to discuss and amend those at that time as well. So um, uh, I don't see any further um, discussion, and I and there's no there are no members of the public um, here for comment, so we can have a roll call vote. Anderson? Yes. Becerra? Oh, um, she had to leave early. I, um, uh, so she's absent now. No problem. Uh, Contos? Yes. Hart? Yes. Hess? Yes. Jones? Yes. Merritt? Yes. Cheryl. Yes. Basica? No. Von Lossberg. Yes. West? Yes. All right, that's nine yeses, one no, two absent. Okay, thank you. Um, so that can go under our committee reports. Um, and we don't have any further business. Um, is there any appetite? I mean, I feel like we've wrapped this up pretty well. Is there any appetite to have any additional discussion on that item? Um, seeing none. Um, oh, Julie. Can I ask a real quick dumb question? Absolutely. What does what is M1R2? Is that a manufacturing district? That's a it's a strange district. M1R-2 is limited industrial residential. It is the only industrial district that permits um, residential. And Spencer can go back to the maps to show which cultivations allowed where. Okay. Um, if you guys could put, get your presentation loaded up uh, to eScribe, that would help me answer those questions for myself. Thank you. M1R-2 is where I live, Julie, which is why you just heard something very loud drive by outside, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Okay. Th thanks, everyone. So um, we, without anything further, um, we can be adjourned. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs>